It is obvious that the new Citroen has fallen from the sky in as much as it appears at first sight as a superlative object. We must not forget that an object is the best messenger of the world above that of nature. One can easily see in an object at once a perfection and an absence of origin, a closure and a brilliance, a transformation of life into matter, and in a world of silence which belongs to the realm of fairy tales. The Citroen DS, the goddess, has all the features of one of those objects from another universe which has supplied fuel for the neomania of the 18th century and that of our own science fiction. The DS is first and foremost the new Nautilus. Blimey, that's quite a statement from French theorist and philosopher Roland Barthes about the Citroen DS. But this isn't any old DS, this is a DS Safari. Poor old Roland would have lost his mind. The DS19 was introduced on the 5th of October 1955 at the Paris Motor Show. During the 10 days of the show, the DS took 80,000 deposits, a record that stood over 60 years until it was eclipsed by the Tesla Model 3, which received 180,000 first day deposits in March 2016. There is no doubt that it has some beautiful curves, but the front of the nose and the bonnet look more like the hull of a boat or Thunderbird 2 to me. The bonnet seems to almost push out like an arrow at the front here, and then we've got these extra spotlights at the front, which almost feel a little bit rally-esque. The Safari, as you can probably tell, is slightly longer and has a higher roof line than the saloon version. So from the side, it looks a little bit like the Ectomobile from Ghostbusters. And at the back, the light cluster, if you squint a bit, looks a little bit like the arrangement of the lights on a DB5. But there's no doubt that the DS's design has inspired generations of draftsmen, and for that, we must be thankful. Lid open here, and then there's these two little really cool latches actually, you can just push either side, and that brings the tailgate down. Got this Range Rover-esque bench seat. Look how much the suspension goes down, crikey. Oh God, a few too many lockdown pies. Anyway, into the back here, look, you've got a massive, massive load space in the back of the car. So here's where it gets really clever. Just pop that up if it'll stay there for a second. Throw that back, unpop that, pop that there, and then you've got an extra seat. There's actually two of these. There's another one underneath the rubber matting, so you can comfortably sit another couple of extra passengers, albeit the person sitting in this far back one's gonna be quite small, but excellent nonetheless. And then of course, very simply, packs away again, flat into the bottom of the car, pop your rubber matting back over, and there's your boot again. Absolute genius bit of design. It has so much space in the back, it would have actually made for a good hearse. I mean, it's fairly somber, has the load space, and importantly, its ride is as smooth as marble. And it very nearly ended up as one as well, when in 1962, Charles de Gaulle and his wife were sprayed with bullets while being driven from the Elysee Palace to Orly Airport. The bullets shattered the rear windscreen, punctured all the four tires, and they escaped only thanks to their chauffeur and the car's suspension system, which enabled the driver to keep driving safely. The ride was so smooth, in fact, that the most British of institutions, the BBC, bought one and mounted a cameraman on the top of the car to use it as a tracking car. Right, so let's take a little look underneath the hood. Just pop my hand in here, release the catch. Let me reveal this magnificent beast. Just pop that down like that. Now, the first thing you're greeted with is this spare tire with the toolkit nestled neatly in the middle of it. And that sat right in front of this massive fan here. And then behind that, we've got the Citroen's 1.9 litre engine. And then either side, you can see these little black spheres. There's one just buried in there. And then there's one round this side. And that's what actually controls all the pneumatic suspension. So let's just have a quick look at those and how they work. 
So these spheres are the chambers that control the hydropneumatic suspension. And there's one per wheel and then there's one accumulator as well as a dedicated brake accumulator on some of the models. And the sphere is hollow except for the rubber membrane which runs across the middle. The suspension works by means of forcing the piston up into the sphere, compressing the nitrogen then in the upper part and the damping is provided by a two-way leaf valve in the opening of the sphere. Liquid hydraulic mineral then has to squeeze back and forth through this valve which causes the resistance and controls the suspension movement. And it even allowed the driver to adjust the ride height which I'll now show you. Mechanics lesson over. So to adjust the ride height, you'd obviously have to have the car switched on. So just start her up. And already you see those chambers are filling up. And we just had the back of the car and the front of the car move. Just check we're in neutral. Yeah, we're not gonna shoot forward. Um, and so as you accelerate, all that moves around into those spheres and levels out and then the ride height is then controlled by this mechanism down here. At the moment, I'm in the middle, but if I pull this and move it up, the car will now start moving. So the car is now sitting in its high setting. It's like pretty off-road setting this. And then I go to the lever now, push it down, and then watch it drop, and it will go super low. Look at that. Right, so that's the suspension. Come in here and I'll show you the rest of the interior of the car. Right, lots to talk about on the interior of this car, but I'm afraid our friend Roland had more to say too. We are therefore dealing here with a humanized art and it is possible that DS marks a change in the mythology of cars. Until now, the ultimate in cars belonged rather to the bestiary of power. Here it becomes at once more spiritual and more object-like. And despite some concessions to the neo-mania, it is now more homely and more attuned to this sublimation of the utensil, which one also finds in the design of the contemporary household equipment. The dashboard looks more like the working service of a modern kitchen than the control room of a factory. The slim panes of matte fluted metal, the small levers topped by a white ball, the very simple dials, the very discreetness of the nickel work, all this signifies a kind of control exercised over motion rather than performance. One is obviously turning from an alchemy of speed to a relish of driving. Right, thanks very much, Roland, but let's take a little bit more of a closer look at some of the details in here because it is full of cool quirks, starting with the door handles. Now, normally you have a lever to pull and then a lock would be sort of back here behind your right shoulder or something. But actually on this car, it's all been integrated into one handle. So it's these lovely stainless steel handles. And then you've got a lot to sort of push forward there when you release it and then you can just open the door quite easily. Just close that. Manually wound up windows as you'd expect of a car of this era. And then a couple of other things. We've got a little side storage bin down to the side. We've got a butterfly pull off handbrake down there. So down below at our feet, we've got the standard three pedal arrangement that you'd get in any manually operated car. But what's different about this is that the middle pedal, the brake pedal, is actually a little button which you push. And so that takes a little bit of getting useful to sort of push and depress. Um, and obviously that is all regulated on the same system as the hydraulic suspension. So it kind of shares that. So when you push the brake pedal, the back of the car goes down as you're driving. And then quite funnily, if you, when you then accelerate, obviously those, uh, those cylinders, those spheres fill back up and the car raises back up. It's quite a strange sensation. In front of you, you've got this really clear view of the instrument binnacles here. And actually they're quite small, surprisingly, given that you've got this massive gaping hole of this steering wheel in front of you. It's quite strange not to have anything in the centre of the steering wheel. It's so open and clear. But anyway, the view through here gives us the view to obviously 
our Jaeger dials, so very lovely period Jaeger dials. And then we've got our manual gearbox here operated on the steering column. So I'll just put the clutch down to do this. Up into first, down into second, across and then back down into third and then whack it up again. Not quite sure where fourth is. We'll find out when we go out on a drive. Your guess is as good as mine, but then reverse is sort of push forward and then down. So that takes a little bit of getting used to in itself, as well as this sort of hydraulic feel and the funny braking system. But other things to note are these supremely comfortable armchair-like seats. They are absolutely fabulous. You could go on a long journey in these and easily fall asleep in the back, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to get out and give it a drive, so that's what we're gonna do right now. Seat belts, yes. Thankfully, no ball bearing adjustment on these. You've just got a bit of canvas bolted to the side pillars. Handbrake is already off, but that's just a little sort of umbrella style thing down the bottom there. And then, and then away we go, hopefully. How far up is this clutch? And off we go. Well, that is very civilized, isn't it? And you've got to imagine you're sort of five up on your way to, I don't know, Devon or Wales or something, singing Kumbaya. But it's got that kind of vibe to it, this car, is that you just sort of expect that you're just going to chuck everything in the kitchen sink in it. No matter how many children you've got, no matter how many bags of luggage you've got, this thing will take it. And keep everyone from moaning about being in the car because it's so comfortable, they'll probably fall asleep. But then it has another magic trick up its sleeve because this thing will comfortably sit and do loads of motorway miles at 70, 80, even 90 miles an hour. The funny thing is, the more time you spend with it, the more it seduces you. And what you might have thought was perhaps a little bit ugly at the start starts to charm you. Perhaps that's how women feel about Gerard Depardieu when he was still knocking about. It's a shame we don't see more of these DS's about, actually, because they didn't really take off in the UK as much as the French had probably hoped, or indeed on the rest of the world. So much had gone into the cars that they were pretty over-engineered and uh, therefore comparatively expensive with all the technology that had gone into them. DS in English is just two letters, DS, but in French, DS is a word, so D and S together phonically sounds the same as the word diez, which in French means goddess. So translated, Citroën diez means Citroën goddess. That literally tells you how special the French saw this car as being. That braking does really take a little bit of getting used to because you're so used to having a pedal with a bit of travel to it. Just having a button which you squeeze with your foot. It's quite a weird sensation, especially when you go piling into a corner a little bit too fast. Here we go, let's just test them here, slowing down to 30 miles an hour from 50, and the back just dips down, but they do the job really very, very well. That's fantastic, because on the way up here, I drove over that pothole and it shook my whole car on its low profile tyres and tight suspension. And on this, I barely felt it, just wafted it over. It's almost like being on a boat at sea rather than being in a car. Words to describe its driving style would be uh, boaty, rolly, floaty, softly slowly but today this is still a very practical and comfortable car even when you put it up against modern day equivalents and it's got those extra two seats in the back lovely flatbed loads of room for equipment the present owner has enjoyed countless holidays up in wales with his mates going for a little camping trip in this and i can see how this car would be like having an extra buddy tag along because it's got such a personality of its own. Having spent the day with it, I do actually have to concede that it has charmed me somewhat and I can see how 
this could be an incredibly fun and practical classic to have in a collection. So if you'd like to get your hands on a French goddess, a piece of art and a comfortable motor car without having to buy all three separately, then head over to Collecting Cars, get registered and have a bid on this Citroen DS Safari. Thanks for watching and see you soon.